Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Don Winslow. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Thank you so much for joining me on today's show. I would reach over here and grab any number of books, any one of a number of books of uh, my guests today, but it would, well, here, let's do this. Here's a favorite of short story compilations, Broken. Here's another one, one of my favorites, The Force, just powerful, powerful book. Um, and I could go on and on. There's so many. One of my all-time favorites, and I have it in paperback, it's just, it's so cool because it reminds me of home here in San Diego, The Gentleman's Hour. But the book that really started turning my head and many other viewers as well city on fire which is part of his city trilogy and then of course his latest is city of dreams who am i talking about of course don winslow is on the show today i have been thinking about and daydreaming about this for over a year june of 21 yeah hello i remember when i was starting out this podcast i thought man if i could get anybody who would they be don winslow was one of the very first ones that popped in my mind so Today is a very, very big day. You're going to see me geek out a little bit. You know what? That just happens because he's one of the greatest writers, I think, of our generation. So without any further ado, put your hands together, get comfortable, pour yourself a drink, whatever it takes. If you've got on your headphones, you're kicked up and watching this on YouTube, just relax and enjoy an hour with the masterfully talented Don Winslow right here on The Thriller Zone. All right. Well, I have. Uh, I was told. I was told by your people <laughs> that uh, uh, Mr. Winslow only has fifty nine minutes. No, no, I don't care. <laughs> hey, speaking thank of which, oh, let, yeah. let's just be official. Welcome, Don Winslow, to the Thriller Zone. Well, thank you, David Temple. I'm thrilled to be here. I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah. Not bad for someone who hasn't had any sleep. All right, we're going to get to that right now because now for my listeners who followed me for almost two years now, they've heard me geek out over your work time and again. So now you get to endure this for the next 58 minutes. Oh, man. I think I think I think I have a hard out at 15. <laughs> I think that's what my people. Wait a second. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're saying. And telling me. <laughs> Shane's on the inside, uh, the uh, IFB, yeah. Yeah, you have 17 minutes to do that out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump into this beautiful book, City of Dreams, uh, of course, very shortly. Uh, I want to save all my all my juice. The heat is the juice. Yeah, all right. Uh-huh. Yeah, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's always the eternal question. Is the juice worth, worth you know, nine squeeze. times out of 10, uh, Don, the juice yeah. is worth the squeeze. All right. All right. I, I think you would say the same thing, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. Actually, I would. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know I w if we're just chatting. I mean, or I should I be waiting for you to ask questions? But no, 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 dude, this I, is I, the no, thing I've about me. The, one of my philosophies and one of the things that Gene and I say to each other all the time in regard to the juice versus the squeeze is when in doubt go you know like do we feel like going for a five mile hike when in doubt go yeah do i feel like jumping in the ocean when in doubt go and almost always it's the right decision that is a great way to live mm -hmm. 
There's a theory in uh, stand-up. Uh, I studied at the Groundlings in Hollywood in my first mm-hmm. tour of duty in L.A., and there's a th- rule called yes and. Hmm. So whenever you're in a scene, Don would say to me, David, quick, take this gun. I'm always supposed to say yes, and you know what I'm going to do with it? Oh, Versus a lot, yeah. yeah, a lot of guys will go, that's not a gun, that's a banana. <laughs> Well, now what I've just done is stopped your mojo. Right, right, so, right. You know, uh, yes, and yes, and when in doubt, go. When in doubt, go. So let's talk about this. You, you, you said you have been without sleep. I have seen you. We saw you, Tammy, and I saw you down at Warwick's. You mm-hmm. and your lovely wife Jean at in, in La Jolla there in bookstore. And you were. That's the first time I've seen you. Just like, okay, I'm, I'm here. Where am I next? Your, your people were going. We're going over here. Folks, there are no people. There are no people. What's the tour been like for you, Don? It's been good. It's been good. You know, um, it, you know, listen, airports are killers. You know, there's, uh, I don't know, few places more depressing in the world. But, uh, but the tour's been great. It's been great to get out and see people. I mean that sincerely. You know, I owe those readers everything yeah. uh, that I have materially in the world. And, and so it's been good. It's been fun, you know, but, um, yeah, it, 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 you know, it's, it's an effort. Well, I know it's exhausting. I can only imagine because I haven't had one yet. Um, but, um, what never gets old for you? What's the one thing you like? You know what? This never gets old right here. What's that thing? You know, it, it, it never gets old on tour. Um, when people come up to you and say that, that you've meant something to their lives, you know, that, that they've enjoyed your work or there was something that you wrote or said that was meaningful to them. That never gets old. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the first time. I think my first time meeting you was at Warwick's maybe Probably. two years ago. Mm-hmm. And that sounds then right. I, yeah. And I've seen you there a number of times, mm-hmm. Nancy and Julie and the gang. Mm-hmm. Um, then I saw you up at uh, Mysterious with Adrian McKinty back in 19 during Thriller Fest. Yeah, that's right. Um, and here's one thing I wanted to say to my readers uh, and my listeners that here's the one thing about Don, if you've never hung out with him, first of all, no, it's two things. There's a genuine and palpable enthusiasm that, that you have for your books and your friends, your people, your, your viewers yeah. and readers. And the other thing is the way you tell a story. And I've heard a couple of your stories uh, several times. And each time, Don, it's as fresh and as exciting is the very first time. How do you do that? Well, that's nice of you to say, you know, um, look, I, I take those evenings really seriously. You know, I, I sincerely feel that if people are going to spend their time to come out and see me, you know, cause time's valuable. Time is life that there's, you know, that's it. There's nothing else but time. Yeah. Um, I want them to have a really great experience. I want them to feel accurately that they've made a connection, that we've connected with each other. Um, I want to, if I can, a little bit make them laugh, <laughs> you know, um, and amuse them or interest them. And, and I want them to come away from that thinking, you know what? I don't go to, I want to go to more of these things. Yeah. Let me go see this guy or that woman, you know, cause that was a really good evening. Um, and so, you know, I, I grew up at, literally at the feet of one of the great raconteurs ever, my, my old man. Yeah. You know, I, I probably told you this story. You know, he was a, a sailor, career Navy guy, and he'd have his buddies. He was an NCO. He was a chief petty officer. Uh, and he'd have his buddies over and they, you know, I think some beer was involved and, uh, they'd, they'd pretend to think I'd gone to bed. Uh, and I'd literally get under the table. And sit there and listen to these guys tell these great stories, David, you know, of their brawls and their craziness and stuff that had happened all over the world. Um, and so, you know, I think I got a good education on, on being a, a verbal storyteller there. That is such a great story. And so they, w- they would literally just kind of pretend. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because of course they knew I was there, sure, you know, sure. but I, I was like real sneaky, you know, kid stuff, you know, and sneak under the table and try not to laugh and all of that kind of thing. And then I heard these stories, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, Egypt, Israel, you know, all over the world. Um, and it was great stuff. And they were very funny, you know. You know, I could go down and list 
all your books. It would take too long because Let's not do that. Yeah. Yeah. We just don't have the time. I'm going to show them on the screen, but I mean, there's 22, 23. See, it's nearly a two dozen, right? Yeah. Somewhere in there. And many of them have become blockbusters. Everybody knows this. And for, for many of our listeners and viewers who don't know, Savages, I think that was one of the very, yeah, that was the first film I saw of yours. Uh, mm-hmm. Oliver Stone did it. And that was, uh, that was a ride. Let's see. Bobby Z was made mm-hmm. in a film. Um, your entire cartel series is uh, being adapted to TV coming up. Yep. FX this? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This year, yeah. Uh, let's see what else. We got The Force with Matt Damon. If you could, hey, next time, could you get a movie star just with a little more heft? Yeah, Maybe? We'll try. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the biggest of all, I mean, come on. This guy right here. Austin Butler, City on Fire. When I saw this, this came out deadline. I think you dropped it. Uh, you dropped it a couple of weeks ago. I was like, yeah. t- "Tell me about this." It can't get any bigger than this. Crazy. I mean, huh? You know, Elvis. Listen, it's 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 funny. You know, Gene and I were were watching Elvis. Right. Uh, you know, one night at home, and uh, and we're blown away as as was everyone by that performance. And then it was the next day or the day after, you know, my agent called up and said, you know, guess who I've got for uh, Danny Ryan? And I said, you know, who? <laughs> well, Austin Butler. So it was crazy. And then I think the following day I, I was on the phone with, with Austin, you know, talking about the part and he's passionate and obviously very talented, smart guy, you know, yeah. but, uh, but also my impression of him is just, just a really good guy, yeah. you know, which, which means something. Well, everything I've heard and read and seen, and I've watched him uh, speak to uh, in a number of different places, he's just grounded and real and yeah. feels unaffected when he should be pretty bent out of proportion when you think about it playing Elvis. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, I think it's that groundedness. Is that a word, David? I don't know. Um, um, it's, it is now. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's hit the dictionary. <laughs> um, I think is what makes him so great for Danny. Yeah. You know, that kind of down to earth, regular guy kind of thing, you know, uh, I think we'll, we'll play well in that role. Oh, speaking of Danny Ryan, we're going to come back around to that. Just one of easily one of my favorite characters you've come up with, but, and I hope this is, um, this is, feels like a silly question, but I, I would love to be, uh, kind of, uh, in the, in that room, my listeners with you in that room when Shane says to you, Shane Slurno, Story Factory, thank you very much, says, Austin Butler. I mean, what, yeah. what did your mind do? Did you just go, Oh, wow, cool. That's nice. Or- no, 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 no. It, I, I didn't, you know, I'm not that blase or that <laughs> arrogant, by the way. You know, yeah. I, I can be arrogant as we all know, but not in that case. Uh, no, it, you know, I, I, I was blown away by it, David. It was like, wow, that, that's really cool. And then I could see it, you know, because I, I never ever picture actors when I'm writing a book. Oh, because only bad things could happen. Do you know what I mean? You, you'd write either a bad novel or a bad film treatment. Yeah. You know? So I, I never have, you know, an actor in mind. Uh, and, uh, and so then when, when Shane brought up Austin Butler, I went, Oh, yeah, that makes absolute sense. And that'll be great. So I was yeah. blown away. Yeah. I wonder, I, I would, I was. When I was researching all your books, there's a few things I learned about. I thought I'd known, folks. I I thought I knew everything about Don, pretty much. Yeah, because we hang out, right? Well, yeah. 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 But, I mean, there's certain things that I did not know. Like, I did not know your first series, this Neil Carey character, Mm -hmm. um, is being – I went to research. I'm like, oh, I want to read those because I've read just about everything else except uh, the Neil Carey series, which was the launch of his career, folks, like the first five books. But Blackstone – I'm just talking to uh, Rick Blywis of of Blackstone the other day. I said, is it true? Did I hear that uh, they're picking up these at a 30th anniversary relaunch? Wow, 30th anniversary. Jesus. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they'll be back. Old Neil, you know, my, my first ever character. So you started that. You must have been, what, eight, nine years old when you started <laughs> that? Man, I wish, you know, David, I, I didn't get started, you know, really seriously writing crime fiction until my mid thirties, early thirties, I guess, you know, cause I, I was just trying to make a living. The, the, the world at large didn't agree that I should be a writer, you know, so I was running around doing crazy things, you know, just making a living. And, 
uh, I was directing Shakespeare in Oxford, uh, at the university there in the summers. And then I'd leave Oxford and I'd go to Africa and lead photographic safaris. And, uh, I had heard Joe Wambau, a great San Diegan, uh, Joseph Wambau, uh, say that when he was a murder cop, you know, in LA, uh, he wanted to be a writer that he determined he was going to write 10 pages a day. So I just left Oxford. I'm sitting in, in, uh, outside of a tent, um, in Kenya, um, with a malaria relapse. It's, you know, prior to dawn, cause we get up very, very early to get everything ready for the clients. And I'm sitting out trembling, um, with a cup of coffee by a fire. Uh, and, uh, I thought, you know, man, it, it, you better do this. You know, you've been talking about it for years. You've been flirting around it for years. Um, maybe you should get, you know, serious. And, and I remembered the interview with Wamba, which I'd heard on the radio in England. And, uh, I said, I can't write 10 pages a day, but I can write five. And so that's, that's how Neil got started. Um, oh. and, uh, pr years prior to that, um, I'd been in England. Um, chasing runaways. And, uh, I was, it was the hottest, hottest, uh, recorded summer in English history at that time. And I was in a tube stop, the underground. Uh, and inexplicably, I still can't explain it. This cool breeze came up the, the tunnel. And I had this phrase in mind, a cool breeze on the underground. And yeah. it, it stuck in my head. Uh, and so when I thought, okay, let's write a book. I still had that phrase stuck in my head. And then I had to ask the question, well, who's on the underground to feel this cool breeze? Uh. Why is he there? What's he doing? Who is this guy? Uh, and that's when I started to write Neil Carey. Wow. That is such a great story. I lived in New York twice. And I remember in the depth of summer, you're going down to get on the subway and <laughs> right. you're standing and every part uh, of you is sweating. Yeah. And all of a sudden there'll be this little breeze that'll, yeah. it, no, it's not smell. It doesn't smell pretty. No, no, no. But it's it can not be a factory treat by any means, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it can be a little cool relief. Yeah. Well, it could get a little of the sweat off of you. you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I lived in New York a number of those hot summers, you know, once when it was 104 and, you know, um, and I was a, you know, a street operative. So I, I, I remember that gritty, hot, steamy feel. And you know what, David? And this is strange. I, uh, I'm nostalgic about it. I miss it in some ways. Yeah. You mean the stink? Yeah. The whole gritty, soulful feeling of it, you know, which, which I don't know the city has anymore. That's right. You were there pre, I call it the pre Disney era. I call it the same thing. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was on Times Square before Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Yeah. When it was crack vials and, and sex workers and, you know, pimps and all of that. Yeah. I remember those days, not as vividly as you, but, uh, yeah. And, and you go there now and it, you feel like you're at a Disney ride somehow. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it feels like real estate to me. Look, I, I still love it. But, you know, when I walk, and it's one thing I try to do when I, when I go to the city, I rarely have time, but I try to take a long nostalgic walk on Broadway on the Upper West Side where I used to live, 104th and Broadway, uh, back in the day when that was small arms fire, you know. <laughs> continually yeah. you know when you when you told friends you know you were moving to 104th and broad where they looked at you like you were already dead you know what I mean? right. it's like, well let's hold the wake now and it was nice <laughs> knowing don and and all of that and there was some reality behind that uh but i i miss those days and i and i i, I can't really articulate or rationalize what a, what it is about them that i miss because they were dirty and dangerous and i was poor um you know, hungry a lot of the time. Uh, but there was a, a certain soulfulness. I don't know another better word. I know I'm not doing this well about it. Um, that I miss. I think it's this. <clears throat> well, you know, you've heard the phrase city never sleeps center mm -hmm. of the universe. And I did two tours of duty there and mm -hmm. both times. I, my, my favorite recollections was coming home from the radio station and then opening my window. I was at 89th and West End. 
Oh wow, we were. I was at eighty seventh in West End. What? Oh, years? that's. Uh, this that's was ninety five. Oh no, I was there much earlier. Okay, yeah. so but, but yeah, I was just two blocks up from you. The best thing ever is opening the window. I would. I remember just sitting there listening to the sounds of the city, all the different sounds and the aromas, and then it became very easy to turn to my typewriter and just bang out words. Yeah. I don't know. There's something. Yeah, I. Well, I'm. Uh, annihilating it as badly as you are, because I can't think of the yeah, word. You know, one of my favorite memories was coming off duty, and I used to walk home, you know, take half an hour to an hour, depending on where I was. Sure. And um, and this is, you know, late at midnight, one in the morning, two in the morning sometimes. But one night in the summer, hot, you know, it was classic hot, steamy New York July nights. Uh-huh. And I don't know if you remember the old Shakespeare and Company bookstore. Oh yeah, up on Broadway there, and um, near Zay Bars and all all of that Teachers Zay Bar. Bars, man. yeah, yeah, and um, they had the windows. You know, they were floor to ceiling windows upstairs, and they were all open, and they were blasting Edith Piaf records out the window, and people were sitting in the center island in Broadway just listening and enjoying, and it, it was just one of those moments. Yeah, you know. Oh, for some reason, when you said Zabar's, although this is not the name of the shop and I can't remember, but I used to pick up bagels on the way to the station every morning. H&H. Thank you. Oh, nobody, everybody thinks like in San Diego, somebody was just asking recently, hey, where I go for a bagel? I'm like, in San Diego? In mm, New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Catch a flight, get a good one. <laughs> I'll tell you about H&H bagels. It's what we served at our wedding reception 38 years ago yesterday. The, oh, I didn't. My best man and his his wife was a minister. Uh huh. My best friend from childhood, Mark Rabinsky, who was a stage manager for little shows like Miss Saigon and Phantom of the Opera on Broadway, <laughs> and his wife was a, a Presbyterian minister, and they were coming where we were to get married in Nebraska. So we didn't have any money, you know, and and our wedding reception was at our house, and we're doing very very casual. And so I said to Mark, could you go to H&H Bagel and fill two suitcases? You don't need any luggage. You know, you can be there for two days. Fill your suitcases full of bagels from H&H. And that's what we served at our reception, except my wife is Swedish. She comes from this little town in northeast Nebraska where the street signs are still in Swedish and English. They're all Swedes. It, it, it always felt like Annie Hall every time I went to dinner there, you know, and, uh, and her, all her aunts literally balked at the bagels. They literally stopped in line and go, what are those? What? And we had to send out someone running out for wonder bread. And we, we had bagels in our freezer for like almost a year, oh. you know, trying to eat through the, the supply of H and H bagels. Oh my God. It's, what H and H of course is famous from the Seinfeld episode of Festivus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man. Nothing like those ba- with a schmear. Can I get a schmear? Yeah, yeah. But I'm a, you know, listen, I'm an Irish guy. I'm an, I, you know, Anglo Irish, half, half wasp and half Irish. So I'd eat them with butter. I have to confess it, it's, I know, I know. It's an, it's an abomination <laughs> unto the Lord. Uh, but, uh, I, I, yeah, uh, a toasted H and H bagel with butter, black coffee and the New York Times in the, you know, ink oh. would rub off on your fingers. Remember yeah. when, you know, oh. yeah. See, but we sound the- like two old men now. This is not good. You know what? I don't give a shit because I got to tell you something. I like those those little visceral memories that have literally evaporated. I said to somebody the other day, I said, dude, go. Uh, I, I should share this CD with you. They oh, said, what, what's that? What? I'm like, yeah. oh, wow. I am I that old already. But, you know, David, two nights ago, I was on an airplane um, and there was a guy in front of me, in front and across the aisle, reading a physical copy of the New York Times. I almost took a photo. <laughs> and I, you know, I thought, yes, that that's great. And you know, it's folding the paper, doing that whole thing we used to do. You know, yeah, the the trifold so that you could sit the in the subway and be able to, yeah, so you could right. read it without doing this because you 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 don't have that extra room in the subway. You know, in newspapers, uh, the the classic news story style, you probably know this, uh-huh. was written for the subway mm-hmm. because. 
editors would say, you never know when the guy's going to get off right. at what stop. And so the lead, you know, the headline, the yep. lead, and then, you know, first it's, you know, man bites dog. <laughs> and if he gets off on 57th Street, at least he knew that the man bit the dog. But if, you know, if he goes down to 14th Street, he's, you know, he'll know the breed of the dog and where it happened. And, and that classic, you know, inverted pyramid style, which I often use, you know, in, in writing narrative fiction comes yeah. from, comes from the subways and well, the commuter trains. I, I want to drill down on that because, uh, Don, uh, and I got so many notes and I would be super respectful of your time. But I, I, when I was reading City of Dreams, which, by the way, uh, well, uh, let's start with City on Fire. When that came across my desk, I went, wait a minute. Is it my imagination or has Don kind of evolved his style a little mm -hmm. bit to a to a whole new thing? And it's if you haven't experienced it, you have to read the book so that you just can appreciate the stylization and i don't mean stylization that gets in the way of the story but that facilitates your eye the ability to just move through it and you're 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 flying through the pages and you don't realize it how do you do that um you know david look hopefully you get better at what you do and not worse you know <laughs> over the years you mentioned 23 24 books so, you know but I think, yeah, in the past few years, I've, I've become more aware of economy and efficiency um, and trying to use the fewest words possible. But I, I'm also really aware – look, we sometimes forget that reading is, is a physical experience as well as an intellectual experience. Right. So that when someone's reading, I, I look very closely at what – it looks like on the page, right? Right. As if it were a painting or a photograph or, or a film shot. Because if I want to, for instance, just grab the reader by the shirt and drag him around for a while, you know, in an action <laughs> scene and not let him go, I'm not going to allow white space on that page. I'm going to make the eye just keep doing that, right? Yeah. Till I'm done with that sequence, usually, but not exclusively action sequences. Other times, though, I want to slow the reader down or I, or I want to focus the reader's attention on just one or two words that maybe stand in for a lot of other things. In that case, there needs to be a lot of white space, I guess what photographers or painters would call negative space, right? around those words. So sometimes, you know, if I'm reviewing chapters, you know, and late in the afternoon, that's all I do is go back and kind of rewrite and revisit things. Um I'll lean away from the, the screen so that I, I can't see the words anymore. I can just see the shapes. And then I ask myself, does it look like what it is? I, I remember the first time I really grasped that movement, this lyrical movement, and it was in Savages. And it was maybe the opening lines. I mean, you would have like something like, Oh fuck. And my that might have been one chapter. Yeah. And then you turn the page and you're on to the next thing, but it might just be sentences. And that's the first time I had seen that. And I thought, "All right, why 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 that?" And then I realized, mm -hmm. "Well, talking about a punch in your face. Do I have your attention yet? Oh, let right. me do this. Let me do that." Yeah. yeah, and I used to think Elmore Leonard was the master of stripping it away. And then you read your stuff and you're like, Elmore, you chatty bitch. I mean, would you just? <laughs> well, yeah. Elmore, listen, Mr. Leonard was the master, you know, the irreplaceable yeah. Elmore Leonard. And I still mourn him. Um, I learned that technique from jazz. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, um, you went through the bebop era and I love bebop. Yeah. But bebop was a lot of notes. Yeah. Right. It was the, it was the Mozart of jazz, right? It's yeah. a lot of very, very fast notes. And then, you know, Miles Davis, uh, and the, the recently deceased, sadly, Ahmad Jamal <sighs> came out of bebop, but they started to do something else and they started listening to the silences. So they could still play those fast, long riffs. <laughs> Uh, but now increasingly they and some of their successors started to play one or two notes followed by silence. Yeah. 
or one or two notes on the trumpet or maybe Sonny Stitt on the, the alto sax and then let the piano chords and the bass chords underneath carry the feeling. Um, so there are times when I'm, when I'm writing and I think about that, you know, is that it, I, I tend to be a rapid fire guy. I tend to be a bebop kind of guy and, and writer, but there are times I think when, when you've got to slow it down and, and again, just that one or two notes, those one or two little images or words, and then let some silence do the rest of the work. Let some reflection do the rest of the work. Man, I'm thinking about Miles Davis, uh, mm -hmm. some kind of blue and blue, uh, green. And I'm just thinking of all these kind of blue is still the best selling jazz album ever. Yeah. And, and then I think about, uh, are you a Dave Brubeck quartet fan? Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my very first album I ever got, I was turned on to, it was in 1964. Mm -hmm. Brandenburg Gate Revisited. Brandenburg Gate Revisited. Yeah. That's the first time I heard, mm -hmm. wait a minute, you have jazz and orchestration mm -hmm. and you have all that five, five, six, seven, five beat with yeah. these long interludes of singular notes. And I was like, but my mom and I used to dance in the living room to that oh, album. That's fun. That's fun. Uh, you know, what, what we don't realize, I think generally the public doesn't realize about so many of these jazz greats is that they were real students of classical music. Oh, yeah. You know, we tend to think of jazz and nightclubs and improvisation and all of that. And that's accurate to, to a great extent. But when you look at Ama Jamal, you look at, um, Thelonious Monk, you look at, you know, any of these guys, they had a very heavy background from like junior high and high school on. They really studied classical music and they knew what they were talking about and, and they knew how to draw the analogies between Stravinsky and what you know, they were attempting to do in the, in the, ja the jazz genre. And, you know, it, it's that, uh, lyrical sense that, uh, the, uh, undulating mm -hmm. uh, rhythm is the same thing. When I read your work, like one of my favorite things is when you have Danny, you have Danny thinking and then Danny speaking. And that mm -hmm. moment of like, uh, I feel like I'm, on an inside, that's one of the things I love about you, Reddy. You're like inside his head, but inside the conversation. So he think he says, he thinks, yeah, like that would ever happen. And all those little moments, and it's the way it's laid out on the page. Anyway, I'm going to geek well, out on technique. You. Yeah, thank you. But, you know, I mean, jazz is, is the soundtrack of, of crime fiction movies, you know, especially in the noir genre. And, and one of the great albums is, is Miles Davis's backdrop for elevator to the gallows the great french noir film you know and and he recorded it in one session he got his a group together and they they were in paris and in the the studio and they they put the movie on uh and they just played to it oh you know i mean he composed but um and you know i have that album of course uh but if you watch that movie you know, um, La Censure, the, I forget what Gallows is in French. Uh, but anyway, you know, it, it, it's classic, isn't it? it? It, it's the voice of, of noir. And, and I think because both art forms are really about the underclass, you know, they're, both art forms come from what Mr. Springsteen calls the darkness on the edge of town. Yeah. Oh, good pull. Very nicely done. Let's go ahead so that we make sure that we don't uh, miss out on City of Dreams and, of course, okay. City on Fire. Um, I'm I'm wondering about, you know, I heard this. I remember the first time I heard the news about you retiring. I think it was mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Glore on CBS. That's and right, Tammy, yeah. yeah, Tammy and I were sitting there having coffee and we're like, we looked at each other like, no, this pinched me. That's not happening. So it made me think, what's he, what's going to be his swan song, you know? And then when mm -hmm. I saw this come out, I'm like, is this the swan song? Um, and why, so why did you decide on this trilogy now? Cause I know that you, you're famous for saying, uh, this is a story I've been working on for 28, 30 years. And I'm like, so mm -hmm. why now? There's an old surfing expression that you probably know. 
sometimes you ride the wave and sometimes the wave right. rides you. you. <laughs> it's also a rodeo expression about horses and bulls, I think. Yeah. Uh, and ex-wives. <laughs> fortunately, don't know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things. In terms of me riding the wave, uh, this has been the work of my life. Um, and when I was reaching the completion of it, having doubted, by the way, for years, my ability to do that, whether I had the chops to pull this off, yeah, um, it felt like a transitional phase. It, it felt like the end of something. In terms of the wave riding me, um, we don't get to choose the times we live in, you know. Uh, and we're living in a time, unfortunately, where democracy is under threat in ways that it hasn't been since the Civil War. Um, and so I think that the issues that we're facing now require a more urgent response and a constant response, not only urgent, but constant, that the novel form is simply not amenable to. And so the, the confluence of those two things coming at around the same time really informed the, the decision. Well, it is a, if indeed the retirement's going to happen, it's a great way to go out. I got to tell you that. I mean, well, thank you. Yeah. You know, beat the band. <laughs> now, I want to know this. Um, I, I know you grew up on Rhode Island. I'm trying to think, mm -hmm. and you, and you lost your, we both lost our mothers in the yeah. not too distant past. And right. I'm wondering, what did mom think about and did she, how, well, she got to see a pretty much a lot of your big accolades, didn't she? She did. My dad didn't. Yeah. You know, my dad passed away. I, I think I'd written maybe one novel, you know, the, the first Neil Carey novel that sold eight copies or whatever it <laughs> sold. But, um, but my mom did. And she was very proud. And there's a funny story about her. Um, she went on her own to see Savages. She was an 83 year old woman who took herself to a matinee at the local little theater oh my to see this tough, sexy, you know, violent movie. Yeah. And, um, and of course the, the theater, you know, it's a matinee, so it wasn't full, but there were people there and, and mostly 20 somethings who, when the lights came up, just kind of looked at her and, and one of them literally asked, what, what are you doing? Here? <laughs> and she said, my son wrote that movie. Oh. You know, she, you know, got on her cane and walked out. Oh, that is awesome. You know, um, and listen, I mean, I wrote most of this trilogy on my mom's porch in Rhode Island. That's right. I love this story. Cause, you know, I, I as I think we discussed, I, I, I start work at 5 30 in the morning and yep. I didn't want to wake people up. Um, and, you know, Jean and I would sleep upstairs. This is this old house in New England I grew up in. And, and my mother by that time was sleeping downstairs. And so I tiptoe around and I'd sneak into the kitchen and make a cup of coffee and then go out on the porch and sit on this old futon. Yeah. Which is still there. I won't let Jean throw it away, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, an old coffee table or sometimes a, a broken surfboard actually, uh, as a table. And, and right, you know, uh, and then we remodeled the house, uh, cause it was literally falling apart. And, uh, Gene said, well, you know, we're doing a remodel. Why don't we make you an office? And I said, no, no, no. I've written some pretty decent stuff out here and I like it. And, you know, I'm happy on my futon. So we kept it. You realize that years from now, there's going to be a, like Ian Fleming's and, uh, Hemingway. There's going to be this, this porch that's, <laughs> Well, I doubt that. Preserved and that's, and that little coffee table in the futon and I, Don Winslow sat here and I wrote his that. books. But I have scars on the inside of my, my left knee because it so often, cause I'm a clumsy, you know, oafish kind of person. And I, if like something would happen or it was needed right away or the phone, I'd get up. And I bang my knee into the side of this coffee table. And so right. I'd be, you know, blood coming down, you know, pant leg and, you know, nasty. 
At which time you would just smear it across your paper, and when you went to hand it into your publisher, you'd say, by the blood, sweat, and tears. Oh. You know, that's not true, but I'll tell you a secret, because it doesn't matter now. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, about the fourth version of the manuscript they sent back in the days when they did it on, on paper. Yeah. You know, the the ultra, ultra, ultra copy, you know, edit. Yeah. I'm not reading that thing. Yeah. I'm not. I don't, I don't care. I, by that time, I hate the book. Right. Um, you know, and so what I would do, not blood stains, but I'd take coffee cups every, you know, 30 or 40 pages and leave it on that page or like a little bit of jelly or something, you know, mustard or something. So it looked like I'd yeah. been working on that manuscript and then I'd send it back in. Yeah. Now those it days can be told. You can't yeah. do that on the computer now. No, you know? no. Um, Let's see. All right. So we know that you get up at 530. You write for like, I don't know, four or five hours. And then you, you're famous for like a six hour or a six mile hike, right? You're still yeah, doing that yeah. every day, right? That's how you yeah, stay yeah. in such sexy shape, right? Well, it's sexy, but yeah, I'm in decent shape. Yeah. Call it what you will, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, um, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. So when did you, what has the 5 a.m. curtain call always been the same for you? Did, has this been, you know, I'm fresh at that hour. So let me just do it that way. Well, just curious. listen, I was seven books, I think, into my published books, into my career before I could quit my day jobs. So in those days, I was writing whenever I could find an hour or 20 minutes or whatever. When, when I was finally able to be a full-time writer, yeah, then that was a constant because it simply required that much time. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I was raising, you know, uh, a kid who, you know, required attention and time, which, you know, was not a burden. I loved it. Sure. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, that, that early start time had more to do with, you know, you just need time on the mat. There's, there's no substitute for it. I'm sorry, there just isn't. You know, I've I've never been wandering through a field of flowers and had the muse land on my shoulders and whisper, you know, sweet plots into my ear. It's ne- I'd love it. That'd be better. Sure. You know, than you know, than working from can't see to can't see. But I, yeah. you know, it, it feels weird to me sometimes if the sun is up before I am. Yeah. It's alarming to me. It's like ooh, something. You know, it makes me anxious. I like it because uh, someone asked me recently why I do that. And I said, it's the only time the world is quiet. Yeah. I mean, think about it, especially yeah. in this town. And New York was the same way. But I mean, yeah. that that hour, you're just in your mind. You have the, the monkey mind hasn't come in and tapped right. you on the shoulder going, I got some I got some stuff <laughs> yeah. for you. <laughs> I've got 57 emails and 38 YouTube videos of cats batting yeah. around watermelons or something. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I don't know. And then, you know, it becomes a routine. It becomes a habit and, and just a way of working. Um, but you know, that first cup of coffee in the morning, still the best, you know, doesn't get any better. All right. Let me, let me tell you something that happened with me. Cause I want to make sure we, you know, we all know that we're here pimping your beautiful book, City of Dreams. Yeah. Um, but there's, uh, something that, and this is going to sound like I'm blowing, hot air up your skirt and i'm not because i know that you don't wear skirts anymore I don't. um you don't know what i'm wearing because this is just you know it's, but i put on a jacket for you and a shirt with a collar and everything man no oh, okay well yeah let me ask you this or let me tell you this this is what has because i you know i study things i make notes i put sticky notes in the books and i go wow. right and i oh yeah i i take a sentence and i might read it three or four times and i like why is that so good? What's the significance of that pacing, that beat and so forth? I'm, I'm that big of a nerd. But I, I, when I finished this last book and boy, the ending grabbed me by, I didn't see it coming. Hmm. I should have seen it coming. And all of a sudden I went to turn that page and it was over and I'm like, rabbit <laughs> turds. <yar." laughs> all right. I'm back. All right. I thought, all right, he, Don has now, you've now officially ruined me. Here's why. My attention span is shortened. Big surprise there. Thank you, Twitter and everything else that comes our way that goes, does like this constantly scanning. But because of the shorter time, it's the way that you, <laughs> you cut to a chase in a way that doesn't leave anything out. If that makes any sense whatsoever. Mm-hmm. 
So you cut to the chase, you're there. I don't feel it. And here's why I say this. You know, I read a lot of books for this show. Sure. I'm picking, I've got, I've got stacks and stacks and stacks to try to read. I try to read right. every single book that comes through here. And I go to pick up the other books and I'm like, this is terrible to say. People are going to hate me for this. They're going to write in and go, do it. You're an asshole. But I'm like, yeah, but can you just get to the chase and give mm-hmm. me, give me the meat? I don't, yeah. I don't need the potatoes right now or the greens. Just give me the steak. Look, that's I, a long winded. Uh, uh, yeah, but I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. I feel the same way as a reader, by the way, and a viewer, actually. Yeah. You know, uh, look, there's an old martial arts expression, and, and I, I've been educated that Michelangelo said something quite similar. Uh, it's about a, it's about a, a defensive maneuver, but that's not important. Uh, but it asks the question, how do you carve a tiger? And the answer is you take a big block of wood and you cut away everything that doesn't look like a tiger. So in the early drafts, I'm not thinking about any of that stuff. I'm just wailing away. I, the reader's not in my head. Nothing's in my head except what interests me. Yeah. But then in the late drafts, you know, 10, 12, 14, um, all I'm thinking about is the reader. All uh, I'm thinking about is the reader. It's, it's no longer about what I like, what interests me, what I think was really maybe good. Um, it's all about carving that tiger for the reader so that, and you got to be careful. You don't cut away too much, right? right. It still has to look like a tiger, right? Don't cut away the claws. Don't cut away, you know, don't get crazy with it. Right. Um, but that's all I'm trying to do, right? Tiger, tiger, tiger. The, to mix metaphors, the, the other thing that I say to myself is that every word has to pay rent or at least do the dishes, <laughs> right? But there, there are no freeloaders in this house, you know? You know, it's so funny. Uh, Tammy is taken that from you and every once in a while i'm and i want to get to a question about this in a second i she's the very first person i turn to i'm like okay tell me if this just sucks balls completely or if it's still salvageable (laughs) did you just say sucks balls did you really just okay my apologies um for the sensitive people but yeah uh which by the way i tammy i've never told you our opening story when we very no. first met, I don't think so. We'll, we'll do that another time. So, right. cause I think my listeners may have heard it, but they haven't heard the, the, the key phrase that nailed it. But she will say, you know, Dave, she'll read a sentence to go, honey, um, this sentence has got to pay rent. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And I'm like, oh, you're pulling a DW. She goes, yeah, yeah. pulling a Don yeah. Winslow. Yeah. But this has to, I mean, do you need all of that? Yeah. And damned if she isn't right every single time. And I'm like, I thought I'd narrowed that down enough. She goes, no, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. You know, it, it, and rewriting is mostly a matter of cutting. Again, you, yeah. you, you got to be careful. You don't cut too much. And sometimes you have to do a graft. You have to add some things in because of what you cut, you know, but. But that's it. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just picturing that reader. Is it making sense? Is it moving along? Is it pleasing to the eye? Is it pleasing to the ear? Because yeah. we forget that when we read even silently, you know, audiobooks being another issue entirely, that we're hearing it in our heads. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and isn't it funny if you will stop and you think it sounds really good in your head and then you stop and you read it aloud, you're like, well, that's kind of chunky. Yeah. Clang. Yeah. 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 It's, it's that dragging that concrete block across a parking lot. <laughs> you know, it's, it's awkward. You know? And it, isn't it funny, Dave, that, that you can be by yourself in a room and be embarrassed? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, did I really write that? Yeah. You know, look around. Did anyone see? You know? Yeah. 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 Well, I don't, uh, I, there's a couple of things I want to make sure I get. I've, I've got all your books. Uh, if I had an ability to move the camera around, I would do it. I have all your books that I own spread out here. And I was going to ask, and it's such a loaded question and you're not going to give me an answer. So I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> all right. But I'm like, I, I said to myself, Tammy came in here one day. She goes, what's your favorite book? And I'm like, well, the, uh, I was like, well, the border, I mean, the cartel series, which we could talk about forever. I'm like, eh, that's good. No, the force. No, no, no. The force. It's absolutely the, f- 
no, no. Broken came along, and it was because it was such a great little um, smorgasbord, a buffet of snacks. Like, I've told you this before over lunch. Crime 101, one of my favorite stories ever. It's maybe 40 pages, and I'm like, But then comes along your trilogy, and I'm like, God damn it. Right when I think that he couldn't get any better or pull me in any further, you come along with this. So uh, just huge kudos. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Coming from you, it means a lot. Well, because I'm such an authority on great writing. Um, all right. Now, here's a question before we go. I would like to know, uh, every, anyone who follows you knows, and this is, it took off, Don, Don, it took off like a rocket on a summer lawn. When you started hitting Twitter with the, I don't even like to say his name, but I'll go with, uh, yeah. I'll go with Trump. Yeah. So when you started that campaign and to sit, to be a, Someone on the sidelines watching that blaze take off. Did you ever imagine it would go? I mean, what are you up to? Like triple digit millions viewings on some of yeah, these videos. Yeah, yeah. Millions and millions. No, 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 David. No, not, not even close to that. Listen, I, I felt and, you know, and, you know, I do the, the, the tweets and, and Shane and I do the videos that, that, um, we thought. Again, you know, life being what it is and the world being what it is right now, that whatever small platform I had, you know, that we would use to, to comment on this and to fight back. I, I, I think some of the real motive behind this was that these right wingers and Trumpers are, are bullies. Yeah. You know, they, there's classic schoolyard bullies, man. They're really tough. Talk tough, act tough until you punch them in the nose. And then what's the first thing they do? They go crying to teacher. Right. Oh, he was yeah. mean to me. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, Shane and, and I have you know, similar personalities in some ways. We, we can be a little pugnacious and we were, I didn't know this until the other night. We were over dinner late at night after a reading. We were each suspended from school for punching a bully. Um, Nicely done, sir. You know, and so, um, I, I think that the original impetus for that was, you know what, we're, we're going to punch back. If if these guys want to go in the alleys or if, if they want to take some very good people into the alley and beat on them, they're not going in alone, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, Kamala Harris, perfectly capable of defending herself. I didn't want to, her to think I've got to do it by myself, alone, that there aren't people out there. You know, and growing up in Rhode Island, playing pond hockey with fishermen's kids and, you know, you dropped the gloves. That was it. If, if, if someone, you know, smacked a friend of yours, it, it didn't matter. You dropped the gloves, you went. Right. 100%. Um, and so that was the original impetus, but I, I don't think we, oh, I know we never thought it would, it would reach that, that kind of audience, but I'm grateful that it did because I think we've had some impact. Well, you have had an enormous impact, and I wonder, uh, and I really don't spend a lot of time in politics on this show for any number of reasons, but I, I know that you're uh, po- politically heavy. Do you, what is your, to overstate the obvious, what's your worst fear possible that oh, could happen? Yeah. The worst fear is obvious. That, yeah. That, 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 that um, criminal, narcissistic, sociopath, wannabe dictator, tin pot, dime store, Mussolini um, as I've said this before, Donald Trump is Mussolini with worse hair and a lesser command of English. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that he that he gets reelected is my worst fear. Having said that, David, though, um, we cannot give counsel to our fears. We <clears throat> we can't underestimate the guy because we've done that to our horrible cost in the past. At the same time, fear doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? I think we're back to where we began. Do it anyway. You know, we can be afraid of what's going to happen. We can be worried. We can some mornings feel more pessimistic than optimistic. Uh, None of that matters. I, I, I know this is not very, you know, 21st century, but in a lot of ways, our feelings don't matter when it comes to this. What, what matters is, is what we do. Yeah. Well put. 
Well, uh, I have a I have a feeling you're going to spend some of this. Uh, I, I, look, I, I shouldn't spend so much time talking about retirement because you still have uh, <laughs> a third book to come out, which I means do. more tour aid and so yeah, forth. Yeah, we'll do this again. Yeah, yeah. But and right. listen, I don't need a book to come out to do your show, man. Do you call me up? It's been a fun conversation. We'll just have a conversation. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you something uh, that I wasn't going to mention, but I. Uh, I couldn't quite pull some of the details together exactly the way I had hoped, but I was, I had a film crew on the ready. We were going to roll up to your house <laughs> and spend, just commandeer that place and turn it into an entire TV show. Well, we'll do it someday. Okay. I'll do that. I'd do that with you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Two more things. I, mm -hmm. I always close with one question. And then okay. if you, if you feel frivolous and carefree and want to play in the sandbox for an extra 90 seconds, sure. we do this thing called rapid fire questions. You got it's it. Silly fun. Okay. Let's do it. But here is first my last piece. What is your best piece of writing advice? You've given us a huge volume of great insights so far, but I know if you distill it down to the essence, Don Winslow is going to bestow <laughs> pontificate pontificate this <laughs> glorious piece of knowledge from mount from my bald-headed wisdom um what i tell aspiring writers lately is do the doable do the doable you know usually long about january i hear from a lot of people i'm going to write my novel this year yeah. no you're not you're not not if you frame it like that because you have a family, you have a job, you have responsibilities. And long about March, you're going to look and go, I've done a page or two. And then you're going to get down on yourself and you're not going to write that novel. And then we're going to hear the same thing next year. Yeah. So what, what I try to tell people is don't say I'm going to write my book this year. Say I'm going to write a page on Tuesday, mm. page on Wednesday, whatever's doable for you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Be realistic yeah. about it. You know, like for me, it was five pages a day. That's not realistic for everybody, you know, because Wombau's 10 pages a day were not realistic for me. Right. But set a realistic goal, but then do it. Yeah. Then do it. You know, that's, that's really the best piece of advice that I can give. Yeah. If you think about it, do the math. Um, if you write a page a day for a year, you pretty much have a book. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. You know, but do it. But do it. It's a Nike kind of thing. Yeah. Put Just your ass do in it. the you, chair. Did you ever realize the, the very depressing, sad origin of that phrase? I didn't know about it. No. It was Gary Gilmore's words to the firing squad in Utah. What? Yeah. And he said, Just do it. And got adopted for this sort of very positive slogan but wow never nevertheless you know set a realistic goal but do it okay wise wisdom from master winslow oh, please come right. on man this little sounder means <laughs> rapid fire questions oh uh, these things scare the hell out of me go ahead this one is so easy it's mm, ridiculous yeah, all that's right that's what they all say okay when writing freehand or keyboard keyboard there you go Library of Silence or Plenty O Music? Plenty O Music. Since I know you love the beach, but spend more time walking in near desert conditions, mm -hmm. which is your favorite if you could have only one? Beach. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Easy. There's a lot of chit chat going about, about being a pantser or a plotter. Do you have one or favor one over the other? Pantser. Ladies and gentlemen, are you listening closely? Don't be freaked out by the plot. Don't. Sorry, that was my two cents. I, I no, took but it. your two cents. You listen. Let's let's pause for a second because yeah. your two cents are extremely valuable. Two cents. Um, we need to make a distinction between story and plot. Story is important. Plot is a party trick. Ah, yeah. We learned that uh, a few books back, we'll in, say it involves a word girl in it, and it seems like everybody's kind of trying to duplicate the trick. Yeah, listen, once once you've identified a trend, here's why you shouldn't chase trends. Well, there's several reasons. Yeah, One it. is, write what you're passionate about, otherwise it's going to suck. Yeah. 
Uh, but, uh, even if you do chase a trend, by the time you've identified that trend, it's on its way out. Yeah. It's useless activity. There you go. All right. Let's see. Number five. Um, I asked this next question because I love getting Tammy's feedback, as we mentioned earlier. <laughs> so first, has Jean read all of your books? It's a two part question. A, uh, you don't answer yet. It has she. And second, do you ever run stories by her for input? Uh, no and no. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't waste any time with no, that. No, I know the answer. I mean, um, she would freely admit it. Yeah. Um, Jean has not read all my books. I, th okay. I think she's reading City of Dreams now. At least she was last night when we fell asleep. Although she okay. does have a habit of falling asleep reading my books. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, no. Um, Look, she's a, as you know, a commercial interior designer. She does, you know, Very offices and restaurants and jails and all, yeah. all kinds of stuff. I don't tell her how to do that. Yeah. And she does not tell me how to write a book. <laughs> and so our 38th anniversary was yesterday. And that's part of the reason, you know. Fair enough. All right. Last one. Let's say, yep. speaking of Jean, you and Jean yep. are joining Tammy and I in our yep. lovely estate for dinner. You can yep. invite three people. If that's pressure, wow. you can go with two. Three people, living or past, wow. to join us for the evening to kind of round out. I mean, Tammy and I would be enough for you. However. Oh, of course. And, and have been. Yeah. To play the game, we're at, we're beefing uh, it up because I love knowing the people that really impress and or affect and or influence boy, you. So, so three people. people I'd love to do that with. Just the first three that pop in your head. And sure, why? Richard Russo. Okay, I'd love to have uh, Jim Harrison. Oh. Although we should make him also cook the dinner, the late Jim Harrison. Yes. Uh Sunny Step. Jazz. Oh, yeah. Saxophone player. He would have to bring the horn to play. Yeah, That's, we won't make him work. We'll yeah, just, no, okay. Yeah. We can put it on in the background. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you yeah. go, okay. Yeah, but but Harrison, we would have made Cook. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're not going to have me do it unless you're going to just throw no, some. No, yeah, no, okay. no, no, no. You no, didn't no, have no. to agree so quickly, Don. Yeah, listen, but we're, you know, we're, we're supposed to be honest and forthright in okay. these things. There you go. Yeah. All right, this was all just page one. So uh, can you imagine if we'd gone to my page two of notes? No, I, I would, can't. Yeah, matter of But fact. this has been fun, man. I've really, I've enjoyed it. We'll, we'll do it, it again, happened. you know. It's it's easy to do. And now that I've conquered the technology, it's... Um, and, you know, next time I'm up there, I'm going to I'm gonna dial some of your electronics in, so it'll be very, very super easy. Oh, would you? you? That'd yeah. be great. That'd yeah. be great. I'd appreciate that. Because the, the nightmare of touring, what I really don't like about touring is is the is this is the technology of everything and you're trying to do it from hotel rooms and people you know say well it's easy just flip it the flob it and you know blah, blah, and, and then the screen saying no you can't do that and you know it gets tense so yeah. as we learned earlier because on the other platform i was gonna i had all these great little video clips that i'm gonna drop in so i'm just gonna figure out a creative way to drop them in uh, in post-production so there better, you go better you than me man yeah so yeah well, folks, to learn more, visit DonWinslow.com. Great looking website. Follow him on Twitter as I do at Don Winslow. Imagine that. He's only got 500 bazillion followers or on Instagram at Don Winslow Films. But wait, there's more. You can go to Facebook at Don Winslow <laughs> Author. Anything beyond that? I have no idea. Yeah, that's it. I, well, I'll be standing out on the street corner, you know, <laughs> usually between five and six, just, you know, randomly reading things. So. All right, until we all gather up at Las Olas. Yes. By the way, can I give you one piece of uh, funny news? We went yeah. there. We took the grandkids when they were in town. We yeah. spent two days at Legoland. Don't yeah. do that. Um, <laughs> they yeah. now charge for chips at Las Olas. No. For the tortilla chips. Yeah, you, know, you have to pay for it. Well, now the center cannot hold. <laughs> Don, thank you once again. This has been an honor. I've enjoyed it, David. Always great to talk with you. And uh, yeah, we'll get together soon. Listen, I'll buy the chips at Los Olas. Resentfully, okay. but I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Not sure if it gets any better than that. I really don't know. Um, I'm not sure it's even possible. But I got to tell you something. That was a highlight. Spending an hour with Don Winslow. 
Fortunately, and this is not to brag, it just happens to be a fact. Maybe it's, you know, he's a great guy. He and his wife, Jean, and Tammy and I have gotten together and just hung out. And everything you see is exactly like it is. There's no pretense. There's no big flashy. There's no star energy about it. He's just a real dude. And man, this was a highlight of my podcasting career. It's almost like if this were my last podcast, I could almost go out with this. But fortunately, I'm not going anywhere. Be sure you pick up a copy of City of Dreams. Matter of fact, let me back up. Let me back up. You need to pick up City on Fire first. I'm not getting paid anything for this. I'm just an avid fan, and I know good writing. This is probably, City on Fire is one of the best books yeah. of last year. There, I said it. And then, of course, the follow-up of City of Dreams. City of Ruins is coming up next, but that'll be 24. Folks, before I scoot, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Um, This podcast is growing pretty well. Personally, it's not growing as fast as I would like because I'm an impatient dude. Um, I'll tell you what really helps. You know what helps? If you're a YouTube viewer, is going and subscribing. Here's all you do. You click the red button that says subscribe. P.S. If you'd like to get alerted to the fact of when a new episode drops... You can click the little bell. It'll go ding, ding. It it doesn't actually ring, but it'll alert you to the fact a new episode is dropped. Other than that, you want to know what really, really, really helps? If you listen to Apple Podcasts, for instance, which happens to be, I think, one of our biggest trending uh, podcast channels. If you leave us a five-star review, you would be amazed. And I hate asking. Matter of fact, if you know one thing about me, I don't ask people for stuff very often. This This is a reach for me, but it does help grow the show. If you just leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, it could be a sentence. Hashtag no press. Just, just, how do you like the show? You like it? What do you like about it? That's it. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, write thethrillerzone at gmail.com. Of course, our website is thethrillerzone.com. Would you like us to hang out for another year? We got so many people still planned for uh, for May. Oh my goodness. You see who else is coming? Well, this was just confirmed. Like literally 20 minutes before I went to record Don Winslow's. This just in. You're the first to know. On next week's show, Jack Carr. Oh yeah. Only the dead. I've never seen anybody blow up quite like Jack Carr. So very excited to uh, have him on the show next week. Please make plans to attend. Still in the month, Chris Hottie's on the way. Matthew Quirk is on the way. And TJ Newman wraps the month. (sighs) I know. Pinch me. Pinch me. I can't even believe we've got this caliber of guests. We also have plenty of brand new up-and-comers, self-pup people. I talk to everybody. I have fun with everybody. Um, Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching today's show. Such an exciting time. Such a pleasure to have you with us. I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone.